emails to the folks who are here so you get to know who we are and then as we take, take your testimony, we'll get to know who you are. I'm Rich Westman, the Senator from Memorial. Uh, Senator Jenny Lyons, uh, Chittenden County. Jenny Ingram, Chittenden County. And coming in late will be Senator Ann Cummings from Washington County and Senator Dick McCormick from, um, huh, or, no, 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 Windsor, 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 one right next to it. Windsor, close, okay, this is good. So um, I understand that Marie Wood, the Director of Familial Cancer Program, uh, Hematology and Oncology Division for UVM would like to be on the phone. So we're going to put her on the phone so she can listen to the testimony and then she will also be providing testimony. Oops, sorry. So we are on S197 and Damien, did you want to just show us what we have for the latest draft briefly or do you? I can do that. Yeah. Let's do that really quick, just the uh, sections that are new. The sections, I think there's just a couple of them, right? Yep, just four changes. Okay. Oh, four sections that are changed. I'm going to interrupt you. This is Marie Wood. Uh, good morning. Is this Dr. Wood? Yes, it is. Uh, this is Senator Lyons. Uh, you are here in the Health and Welfare Committee room with members of the committee and other interested folks. And we're happy to have you on the telephone. You'll be listening to the testimony. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, and then when it's time, we'll ask you to offer some testimony as well. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here. Damian. Great. Good morning. For the record, Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. Uh, so, I believe all of you have on your iPads the uh, draft 1.1 of a proposed committee amendment um, that I, I drafted up. Um, and so what this would do is it addresses some of the concerns that were raised the last time we talked about uh, the existing language that permits the use in the statute that would permit the use of genetic information that was in an individual's medical record regardless of whether there is an actual uh, physical or medical condition that's resulted from the genetic predisposition to that condition. So um, the first is in section three. This is in the genetic testing section of the, the health law. Um, and it, it is a general provision that uh, prohibits insurance offered or issued in the state being underwritten or conditioned on the basis of in currently any requirement or agreement that the individual undergo genetic testing or the results of genetic testing of a member of the individual's family. And this would modify it to add uh, genetic information of the individual that may be associated with a potential genetic condition in that individual, but that has not caused a diagnosed condition in the individual, um, or the genetic information of a member of the individual's family. Um, and so it's broadened the uh, reference for the family there to genetic information generally, and then it's addressed the issue of if you have an idea identified genetic information in there, but it hasn't resulted in a diagnosed condition. Uh, the one word that I would note that uh, you may want to consider um, changing here, um, and I don't know if this is necessary, it's just a question for those who have more expertise, is the word caused. Um, because I, I don't, not being a doctor, I don't know if caused is the Positive right term. Or, yeah. Is it a cause effect or is it that the condition is manifested or, or some other phrase there? But that's just something to flag for consideration. Yeah. The next change is in section four. Now we're getting into the insurance law. The changes to section four, five, and seven are the, the second, third, and fourth instances of amendment. And they're all essentially the same change. And what we're doing is the same as we've done above, we're making the language consistent with that. So genetic information of the individual that may be associated with a condition that has not manifested itself uh, cannot be considered for purposes of conditioning insurance rates or the provision or renewal of insurance um, or certain coverage or benefits. Um, and then we're clarifying, I, 
actually we're just keeping consistent the genetic information of a member of the individual's family. Um, and that change is consistent throughout. The only other changes in here um, are just updates on cross-references and deleting language that allowed results of genetic testing or genetic information that would, of family members that was contained in an individual's medical record. Um, and keep in mind genetic information, that definition covers things like a disclosure that your family has a history of heart disease or um, of other certain types Life of conditions. Yeah, right. So, um, so uh, those are the changes. It's, okay. Um, six the, pages, the, but. So we had talked about this last time, and thank you for bringing this to our attention. I think that's what we're going to be hearing about today from a number of folks, so this is helpful. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Deborah Leonard is here. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Good morning, Senator Lyons and members of the Health and Welfare Committee, and a special good morning and thank you to you, Senator Ingrams, for um, sponsoring the bill that brings us together. I'm Deborah Leonard, and I'm here today to ask for your support of S-197, a bill that would protect Vermonters from discriminatory practices based on their genetic information. By way of introduction, I'm currently Chair and Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Vermont Health Network and the Robert Larner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont. In addition to my medical training as a pathologist, I have a doctorate in molecular biology, which is the study of genetic material used to control cell and body functions. My medical specialty is called molecular pathology or genomic medicine, which focuses on testing of genetic material, specifically <clears throat> DNA and RNA, for medical purposes, including for cancer, infectious diseases, I will not be talking about COVID-19 today, <laughs> um, and, and inherited diseases. I have practiced for 28 years and seen major advances during the course of my career, including testing advances that the, allow us to know the genetic sequence of an individual person's genome for medical purposes, for research, or even for an individual's curiosity about their geno genomic information. I've served on National Genomics Committee Committee's advisory to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the National Academy's Genomics Roundtable. In Vermont, we're transitioning our health care and payment models toward prevention of disease to keep people as healthy as possible. Overall health and well-being are determined by many factors. About 60% of overall health and well-being is determined by social determinants of health, such as education level, income, which can determine access to housing, food, and medical care, and personal behaviors such as exercise, smoking, and diet. Medical care only contributes about 10% to overall health and well-being. The other 30% is determined by an individual's genetics. Yet we do not routinely use this information in healthcare. The University of Vermont Health Network is changing this. On November 1st of last year, we began offering genomic testing to our patients through a few of our providers so we can begin integrating genetically determined health risks into the care of our patients. While we often think about genetic diseases as rare conditions, diseases are associated with approximately 6,000 of our 20,000 genes and the World Health Organization es estimates that single gene genetic disorders affect about 1% of the world's population. And this doesn't include diseases that are caused by a combination of changes in multiple genes. Knowing genetically driven disease risks before the onset of symptoms can allow us to monitor for disease onset, to identify the early stages of disease when interventions may be more effective, and to provide appropriate treatments because we will have a diagnosis. I would like to share a personal story. My husband, Greg Merhar, and I gave each other our genomes for Christmas in 2014 and received our results in 2015. Yeah, we're really nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's genome showed genetic changes that cause a rare <coughs> genetic disease called familial Mediterranean fever, or FMF. We realize now that Greg had symptoms of FMF since he was a teenager, 
but the symptoms are not very specific, although rather severe, and include extreme abdominal pain, slow healing from injuries, and general aches and pains. Over his lifetime, Greg underwent many medical studies and tried many over-the-counter remedies, but nothing worked to relieve his symptoms. To our surprise, we found out that FMF is treatable with a drug called colchicine, which is also used to treat gout. He says he met me so he could get a diagnosis and feel better. <laughs> his primary care physician has patients with FMF, but didn't think about FMF as a cause for Greg's symptoms because Greg does not look Mediterranean. He has blonde hair and blue eyes. Genetics also can help physicians consider diagnoses that they may not otherwise consider. Unlike Greg and me, who were just curious and bold about learning our genomic information, many people fear the misuse of their genetic information, so may not agree to have genetic testing to inform their health and health care. The Federal Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, also known as GINA, passed in 2008, only protects Americans from health insurance and employment discrimination based on their genetic information, but does not protect against other forms of discrimination. So Vermonters may see the risks of genetic discrimination as greater than the potential health benefits and not agree to have genetic testing to inform their health and health care. S-197, if passed, would more fully protect Vermonters from most any type of discrimination based on their genetic information. As we move forward with broader use of preventive genetic testing and proactive genetic testing, these protections will be important for Vermonters to benefit from this advancement in healthcare. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if that's Thank valuable. You. Thank Do you, you have that? Uh, electronically, so we could put it up on our. I do. Thank you. That would be helpful. We'll I can send, send it to Dory. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Got a lot of data in there. Things have changed since the 80s and 90s. People used to say you're 85% genetic and 15% environmental, but a lot different today. Yeah, and the 30%, we don't understand all of that 30% yet. But what we're doing is sequencing genomes and then going back to those over time. So it's not like a usual test that you do once and, and, and you'll do over and over again like a cholesterol level. Right. Um, your genome won't change. So we can sequence it once and then just revisit it as our medical knowledge or your symptoms change. Questions? Oh, sorry. I didn't know whether there would be any questions. Any questions? And your, I hope your genome turned out okay. Mine was boring, but I think having a boring genome is <laughs> good. <laughs> Better than having it in this. <laughs> All right, terrific. Um, Leah Burke, welcome. Thank you. And good morning, Senator Lyons and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. My name is Leah Burke, and I'm here today to ask you for support for S-119, introduced by Senator Ingram, thank you, a bill that would help protect Vermonters from discriminatory practices based on their genetic information. I'm a clinical geneticist, and for the past 20 years have been the head of the clinical genetics program at what is now the University of Vermont Medical Center um, and Health Network. I'm also a professor in the Departments of Pediatrics and Medicine at the Larner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont, where I've taught genetics and genomics to medical students, residents, and fellows in training. Nationally, I chair the Council on Genetics for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Within the genetics program at the University of Health, uh, Vermont Health Network, I examine, diagnose, and treat patients with suspected or confirmed genetic conditions. As part of that, I do mostly diagnostic genetic and genomic testing, but the family history is a very important tool in the work that we do, and therefore the clinical care extends to that family. Once a genetic diagnosis is made in a patient, there may be clinical indication to test other family members. For instance, Sometimes, if a condition is caused by two genetic changes in a gene, the parents need to be tested to determine whether those changes are in the same copy of that gene or on each of the copies of the gene. That helps in our uh, treatment of the child or person that has been diagnosed. 
Additionally, because of the variability in the expression of a genetic condition, a parent may actually have the condition without having the same signs or any signs as, at all as their child. Having this information is clinically important for the child as well as the parents to give accurate recurrence risks. Therefore, we often place genetic information in the charts of unaffected individuals. In addition, the family histories that we place in a patient's chart often contain genetic information about their family members. As I mentioned, a family history is considered an important, uh, as important to a patient's care as the past, past medical history. My position also involves overseeing and collaborating with genetic counselors. The genetic counselors see individuals with conditions that are thought to be genetic for diagnostic testing. They also see patients and families for counseling around their family histories and possible genetic testing based on those family histories. We provide counseling and arrange testing for the persons coming in and also for members of their families. Most of the time, the individuals seen for genetic counseling, I'm sorry, uh, coming, uh, seen for genetic counseling and tested for that um, because of a family history are adults. There are recommendations against testing minors for adult onset conditions that run in the family, but as in much of life, there are exceptions that need to be made. For example, we have babies or young children who are going into the child protective system or being placed up for adoption who have a known genetic condition in one of their parents. It is in the child's best interest to have as complete a medical history as possible in the, those situations, so genetic testing for a later onset condition may be done. The child is not symptomatic and may never develop symptoms, but will need to have specific monitoring done to look for the symptoms that may appear. Without the genetic testing information, the family history may be lost or misinterpreted, and the child may have a delay in diagnosis. In particular, one child had a parent with a hereditary cancer syndrome. The child was tested and found to carry the cancer predisposition mutation, and therefore will receive earlier screening than they would have with a general population risk. The patients and families that we see want to know their genetic risk so that they can have proper screening and make life and pre reproductive decisions. Their family members' genetic testing results are placed in their charts so that the laboratories doing the testing can provide more specific and accurate testing. Even if they decide to wait on genetic testing, the family result is often placed in their chart. They need protection against discrimination for their own pre-symptomatic testing result as well as the results of the family members. We have found that having genetic testing results allows for a more specific diagnosis that in turn allows us to give more accurate prognostic information and screening practices and allows the families to participate in clinical trials. Having the ability to test in family members who are not asymptomatic assists us in that effort. Finally, I'd like to say a word about newborn screening programs. Newborn screening programs, Vermont's included, now include conditions that involve genetic testing and may have a later onset. For the traditional newborn screening conditions, such as inborn errors of metabolism, the tests done were primarily biochemical and not genetic, and treatment was initiated right away. With the new conditions, such as spinal muscular atrophy, Pompe disease, and X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, the testing done up front includes genetic testing. And in these conditions, the asymptomatic period can last for years, and treatment is not begun right away. So now we have a public health initiative that automatically does genetic testing in the pre-symptomatic phase of disease. A public health initiative that automatically affects all children born in Vermont and may have an adverse effect on their insurability. You were given a handout uh, containing the informed consent that we have all patients or proxies sign before proceeding to, with genetic testing. Informed consent is required by both Vermont and New York where we also uh, have a lot of patients, as well as most of the clinical genetic testing laboratories that we use. 
The last paragraph in that consent warns against the discrimination that may, they may encounter as a result of the genetic testing we are recommending. It is my hope that this bill may result in our ability to eliminate or at least alter that paragraph. I applaud your forward thinking in proposing S-197 and expanding the protection against discrimination to include genetic and genomic information. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Terrific. So, um, and I, again, it would be very helpful to have your yes. comments electronically. So this, the informed consent that you have folks sign, really, um, what happens when someone sees this and reads it? What is the response? That, that's a very good question. Uh, as with much of informed consent, not everybody reads all the way through it. Our genetic counselors and I try to also bring up those issues when um, we are counseling patients. <coughs> Some patients decide not to have testing because of the risk to insurance. That is absolutely true. Some feel that um, if it's a child, they will get insurance in place before they have genetic testing. That's true even for themselves. Um, so, and, and some decide to go ahead and hope for the best. Um, what well, if, uh, if folks uh, pay for it themselves, what, what's kind of like a ballpark figure about how much it would cost? It really depends upon the testing. Mm -hmm. So um, if we're doing a single gene, it's usually um, around six or eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. If we do a panel of genes, it may not be much more than that because the technology involved, and um, Dr. Leonard can speak to this better, is not much different in doing one gene than many gene because they're done in a massively parallel sequencing. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but if you do a large panel or an exome, then you're talking um, several thousand. Mm -hmm. The price keeps going down, but it's still a burden for, for families, obviously. So a question for Dr. Leonard probably, and that is, uh, we are doing this testing locally? Um, yes. Some of it, yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, the, but often partnering with um, companies who uh, share our values and mission of okay. bringing genetics into medical care. So the laboratory that does it is at the university? Or? For cancer testing, pharmacogenetic testing, mm -hmm. and rapid diagnostic mm -hmm. um, exome or genome sequencing. Mm -hmm. we, we are or will be doing that at the laboratory at the University of Vermont Medical Center. For the rare diseases, um, that's really taken care of by uh, larger genetic testing laboratories that receive samples from all over. Other questions for Dr. Burke? Thank you. Thank you. This is like taking a grad course, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Wood, I have you on. Are you still online? Hi, yeah, Anne. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, and we would welcome your testimony. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning to all of you. And again, thank you for allowing me to testify in support of S-197 by phone. I do believe that this bill could help to destigmatize genetic testing, improve care for patients with inherited cancer risk, and potentially save healthcare dollars. And I'll tell you why I think that. Um, as you know, my name is Marie Wood, but what you don't know is that I'm a medical oncologist and clinical researcher. I have been at the University of Vermont for over 20 years. My clinical work focuses on breast cancer and genetics, and my research focuses on both genetics and cancer prevention. I'm a professor of medicine and the associate director for cancer control and public health science at the University of Vermont Cancer Center, and also the director of the Familial Cancer Program, where all the cancer genetic testing is performed at the medical center. Nationally, I serve as the co-chair of prevention for the Alliance for Clinical Trials, which is a cooperative group developing clinical trials for patients with and patients at risk for cancer. I also serve on the NCI's Prevention Steering Committee and the NCI's central IRB that reviews prevention studies for protection of patients' rights. 
I've been working in the area of cancer genetics since my fellowship at the University of Colorado, which I completed in the early 1990s. I've established two clinical and research programs in cancer genetics, one at the University of Colorado, which still exists, and one here at the University of Vermont when I arrived. I've been working with people with inherited risk for cancer since the discovery of BRCA1 in 1994, and was involved while at the University of Colorado in the first clinical genetic testing for this gene. Okay. I've, been, um, I've seen and been involved in considering the impact of cancer genetic testing, not only medical, but also ethical, legal, and social impact for the majority of my medical career. In the early days of genetic testing, we kept separate or shadow charts for patients undergoing genetic testing, a little bit like what Dr. Burke was talking about. We did this to protect the patients from misuse of their information. While we did not understand all of the possible ramifications, we did worry about employment and health insurance. With the introduction of the GINA legislation, which you've heard about, which happened in 2008, more widespread use of genetic testing, which you've also heard about the explosion of genetic testing, and this was done for cancer risk, and the need for providers caring for these patients to have access to the information, we were obliged to put our genetic testing information into the patient's medical record. That is now our standard practice and provides critical guidance for cancer prevention and sometimes cancer treatment for our patients. And this is really an example of how we provide the best medical care if we remove all barriers to genetic testing. As I've said, there's been an explosion in our understanding of cancer genetics with the discovery of many new cancer-related genes. We now offer a panel of genes to our patients. Genetic testing offers a way to identify risk and take action. For example, starting high-risk screening, such as screening breast MRI, which is added on to screening mammography, or more frequent colonoscopy, sometimes as common as every one to two years, or having preventative surgery, such as removing almost the entire colon, or removing breast tissue. The, this is most important for unaffected individuals as they may be able to avoid a cancer diagnosis with these preventative actions. Currently, the uptake of testing among family members when a gene mutation is identified in a family is less than 30%. This may be due to concerns regarding the potential for discrimination. In fact, our group completed and published a national study showing fear of discrimination was a significant barrier to genetic testing among untested relatives. It's therefore imperative that we do as much as possible to destigmatize genetic testing. Genetic testing for cancer risk has the potential to save healthcare dollars, I believe. This becomes evident when you consider today's high cost of treating cancer and compare that with the cost of cancer screening. For example, colonoscopy, which can identify and remove early precancerous polyps, can prevent colon cancer in people with inherited risk for colon cancer. Colonoscopy is far less costly than treatment of cancer, although nobody likes a colonoscopy. <laughs> Additionally, preventative surgery, for example, to remove breast or ovaries, can reduce the risk of breast and or ovarian cancer by more than 90%. And as you can imagine, it's far less costly than treatment for either of these cancers. Moreover, this does not even consider the quality of life associated with avoiding a cancer diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> In closing, I want to thank you for consideration of this important legislation, which I believe, as I've showed you, stands to destigmatize genetic testing, improve um, care of cancer patients, and may even save healthcare dollars. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wood, I guess I should ask this to everyone who's testifying. Um, 
including those who haven't, but the, the question that was um, brought up earlier as we went through the bill about cause and effect relationship between genetics and what your genetic predisposition is and, and actually expressing the disease. So it can, I, I guess I would ask you, Dr. Wood, to begin, if you could, with your, if you have thoughts on that. Um, if not, we can, we can let you reflect a little and come back later, but um, I, I'm looking also at Dr. B uh, Burke and Dr. Um, Leonard, so. So I'm happy to tackle that and speak specifically to cancer. The correlation between having a genetic mutation and getting cancer is not 100%. Yeah. It depends upon the gene, and as Leah Burke has told you a little bit about, it may also depend upon the family history. Our knowledge is exploding in this regard and really depends upon testing more people so that we get more accurate risk assessment. For some people, it would may be a slight increase in their cancer risk. For others, such as BRCA1 or BRCA2 or even these colon cancer genes, that risk is significantly greater than 50% and may approach 80 or 90%. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. That's very good. Uh, we'll, we'll look around the room for others later. We'll, we'll have a little conversation later on about this, if, unless you'd like to say something now. But it's probably which has not resulted in the condition in the individual. Mm -hmm. it, it, wording could cause, be wording. instead of cause, but has not resulted in the condition in the individual. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, very good. Any other questions for Dr. Wood? Thank you very much. And again, it would be extremely helpful if we could get your testimony electronically so we can have it on our- Happy our to do that. Thank you. All right, good. Um, so, Chris Rice, are you testifying or Dr. Gleason? Dr. Gleason is here. He is. Thank okay. you. Why don't you come up and introduce yourself to the record. Is your testimony uh, online, is that, is that, or not? Um, I submitted the one that was written by the ACLI. Got it. I've been sitting here rewriting mine in response to their excellent <laughs> comments this morning. Well, that's good. Okay, well, this is, we need to have some uh, discussion. Yeah, I'm happy to, so I'm here. Um, clearly, Drs. Burke, Leonard, and Wood have credentials in genetics that trump mine. National recognition and leadership of committees that are very important and doing really good work. My expertise is in life insurance underwriting. I'm the guy who applied genetic tests when the applicant wanted to buy a million dollars worth of life insurance, and I know how it works. <clears throat> and I think that we're actually not that far apart once we get to some clearer understanding. I'd like to address at the get-go a couple of diseases they mentioned. Familial Mediterranean fever treated with colchicine has no extra mortality and is totally insurable at the best rate. BR Dr. Wood mentioned some colon cancer or some breast cancer genes that people have surgery for. We recognize those surgeries as curative, no extra mortality. So I just wanted to address their two questions right off the bat and then get to my uh, testimony because it's important that people understand how we use information, and I really don't have the time to go into underwriting detail and how we think about things, but I'd love to have the opportunity to talk about it. Um, we certainly don't want to interfere with the progress of scientific advances or improvements in medical care. We're all in favor of that, as I think everybody in the room is. As a background, I'm a physician. I spent 27 years as medical director of Northwestern Mutual where almost all of my time was either <clears throat> in underwriting or legislative matters such as this. I left at age 60 and went to the Medical College of Wisconsin as an associate professor and director of preventive cardiology where half my patients had inherited disease. I am currently a medical consultant for the American Council of Life Insurers. And right now we are working, the ACLI, with the National Society of Genetic Counselors on a joint webinar to understand 
misperceptions about their work and our work. And it's actually a very exciting thing and been, <coughs> excuse me, great opportunities. That cough is nerves, not the virus. <laughs> life, life insurers, and we're talking about individual life insurance, where people choose when they buy and how much to buy. It's not group insurance, which is available for individuals, and it's not health insurance where the premiums are adjusted every year. In life and individual life insurance, the premiums are set at the time of underwriting and cannot be changed at any time in the future. Individuals have for 100 years trusted us with their private and personal information because they know that that's A, how the system works, and they know that we have to be able to assess risks so we have the proper money to pay a claim that may not become due for five or six decades. We are required by state law to treat like risks in a like way. We are not allowed to, make, to treat like risks differently. The states routinely send auditors to companies around the country where they pull up records and be sure that you've followed your rules. And they do things like check our mortality results to see that people are falling into the right bucket. It is a tightly regulated um, environment. The main goal is that we have the sufficient funds to pay all the claims. We may underwrite somebody today and they get hit by a bus. Tomorrow we will pay the $2 million claim. No questions asked. They may die at age 80. They bought a policy when they were 25. They may die at age 80. We will pay the money and we will have the money to pay that claim. We're required to do that and they also ensure that we have those monies. It's important to remember that insurers are in the business of selling and placing life insurance. We do not look for ways to decline applications. And when we underwrite, we underwrite with the written consent of the applicant. They're entering a voluntary contract and they want that contract to be respected on both sides. For the past 75 years, advances in medicine and testing have helped both physicians and underwriters understand disease better and treat it better. Life insurance during that time has simply become more affordable and more widely available. For example, blunt instrument, 75 years ago, any, everybody with a heart attack was a decline. Life insurer wouldn't look at him. Today, heart attacks are broken into all kinds of pieces. How much muscle damage was there was? How many stents did they have? Bypass surgery, are they on their statins? Are the patients compliant? So underwriters are competitively looking for a way to find a way to sell that patient with a heart attack insurance at the lowest possible rate. It's also important to remember that all tests can help customers, including genetic tests. Genetic tests today are increasingly part of the medical record, and they understand both the physician and the underwriter help understand the disease better. There are genetic tests that indicate some lymphomas barely need to be treated. So now we know that not all lymphomas are going to be the same. Show a life insurer that information, and a life insurer is going to go, oh, I feel a whole lot better about that, knowing this genetic information. If somebody has a positive history for breast cancer, and they come in with a negative breast cancer gene, the life insurer is going to forget about the positive family history. That's an important consideration. If the patient has the family his positive family history of breast cancer, and they have the BRCA gene, now, like Dr. Wood was saying, they're going to start to get more advanced mammograms or better mammograms, and they're going to do better. Life insurers look at that and take that into consideration. We also, all life insurance medical directors, are trained in statistics and understand the probability and the breast cancer genes are never 100%, and we understand the disease may not occur for years. That helps to lower the rate. So it's how we use the information that I think is the missing piece. 
The bill under consideration today would prohibit us from using both genetic test results and family history. First, that prohibition would prohibit people from using favorable genetic tests. And second, in those instances where the genetic test indicated a medical risk and we could not know it, the applicant, we would have asymmetric information. And the applicant can then use that information and apply for an increased amount of insurance. We know from studies that people who have tests for Alzheimer's and Huntington's buy insurance at five times the rate. They also buy larger policies. Now somebody, the other people of Vermont, have to pay that difference. And I understand Huntington's is a difficult disease. Everybody hates that disease. But we can't change the life insurance industry and the financial protection we provide to Vermont families and consumers and businesses in order to provide protections for one small group, only a couple per 100,000 people. Many of the other issues that were raised today, I think can be addressed by understanding how we actually use that information when we make decisions. Because I don't think we're as draconian, anywhere near as draconian, or as um, single-minded or looking for reasons to decline. I think we're actually, I think we need to have some dialogue and, and talk about that. So I would love to be part of that. Um, the prohibition on family history would make Vermont a first in the nation. Some people may say, well, that's wonderful. Um, but this is something that has been an integral part of the underwriting application. And when we ask it, we're not asking for the detailed um, tests in your brother's medical record. What we're asking is, did your brother have a heart attack? Does your brother have cancer? That's the level at which we would mean the family history question. So it's not um, delving deeply into somebody else's medical records. We were, would be prohibited from using anybody else's medical records to make a decision about an applicant. Um, and I think that we can accomplish um, a great deal recognizing that it's important that genetic testing uh, both be further developed and go forward and used preventatively. Um, life insurers have no interest in the whole genome. It's 23 billion base pairs. We wouldn't have the computer database to put that stuff in. Um, but I think that we need some clearer understanding of both their concerns and an explanation of what that really means to us. Because um, I think we're closer than, um, than, than we might, others might think. Um, I say that having testified first about genetics in the early 1990s in the state of Wisconsin, where somebody, a legislator, said a drop of blood at birth can determine how long a baby's gonna live. And, We've been going around those and dealing with misperceptions about how we use insurance or our interest in it for a long time. So I think I'd stop there and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you. So I see you've included something about the state of Maine language. Yes. In the testimony and that follows at the end of your, of the written testimony that we have from you. Mm -hmm. so we um, so I, I guess the question I would have, and I, I, I do want to make sure that we hear the other folks in the room who are mm -hmm. here to testify, but um, you said that uh, you want to make sure that uh, people can continue to trust the insurance companies with confidential information, and that this might, that, so my question is, would, once um, the genetic information is available, and mm -hmm. part of the record for that individual. Should the individual begin to express a, a disease, 
and uh, require specific types of coverage. Are, it, has the insurance industry considered what happens then and how that might be put into um, your underwriting process? Are you talking about life or health insurance, ma'am? Health insurance. I'm talking individual life. And, uh, well, let's go with life insurance. Okay. Either one. Individual life insurance, we have, because health insurance is covered by GINA. Yes. Individual life insurance, when we, you apply, we underwrite using the information we have. If your history application is clean, doesn't have any red flags, and you fill out a non-medical and maybe get some blood, we're done. You've got your $500,000 policy. If you're applying for a $2 million policy or you have a history of a prior disease, we may ask to see the medical record. We get the medical record and we look through it and see those tests. Most of the testing information actually makes us feel better. We're looking for ways to issue the policy. Once we, and the treatment you have. So once you have the policy, we can't change the terms or conditions or anything forever. It is set in stone. So we have one opportunity to do this. So whatever develops after that. Do you put condition, can you put conditions into uh, that type of policy for um, health care services, primary care, preventive care, or not? No. <clears throat> we set a price. That's it. That's it. Questions. Uh, go ahead. So the so the language in the written testimony that we have is is, is really just about um, these uh, direct to consumer genetic tests, right? And, and in most other states recently, the concern has come with direct to consumer testing. Mm -hmm. So so you would be satisfied if that's all that we did. Then you're not. Are, are you asking for something more? No, than, no. Our our con care? life insurers are not interested in direct-to-consumer testing, mm -hmm. with the sole exception of that little bold print that says, discuss this result with your doctor. Mm -hmm. What we really want is that individual to go to one of these three ladies who taught, three physicians who spoke and are geneticists, mm -hmm. and get that test repeated in an accurate way in a certified laboratory, and then correlated with the medical, the individual's medical history. So we're not interested in direct-to-consumer testing. Mm -hmm. And in other states, that has been a lot of the driver mm -hmm. for uh, legislation. Okay, but in terms of our bill, mm -hmm. that, that's, this is really the heart of what you're asking then. You're not asking for us to do anything other than, uh, Correct. than prohibit the direct-to-consumer testing. Okay. okay. Other questions? Thank you. You Thank you. Thank you very much. But um, is Emily Adams here. I'm going to put you next because okay. I thought that was you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. And Falco, you are going to be last. All right. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Emily Adams. I'm an assistant attorney general in the civil rights unit of the attorney general's office. This is Eliza, she is three months old and she is currently at work with me. Um, so she's joining us today. <laughs> and hopefully she will sleep through this testimony. With any luck, but Charity is here just in case. <laughs> um, so my job within the Civil Rights Unit um, is, in for, is overseeing our day-to-day -day employment discrimination investigations. So my testimony today on this bill will be limited to the changes to Vermont's Fair Employment Practices Act which I believe I have the hard copy um, that is on page seven of the bill under the stars that says employment. Um, what we do in the Civil Rights Unit by way of background is we um, enforce both the Fair Employment Practices Act as well as several other employment discrimination related laws. Um, we, can, we have the ability to investigate private employers uh, for potential violations of that law. In addition to our investigations, we field complaints and inquiries from the public related to employment discrimination 
um, and other workplace discrimination issues. So this um, S197, as written, would add genetic information to the list of protected categories under Vermont Fair Employment Practices Act. That would mean that employers could not discriminate against an employee based on their genetic information. Um, as you can see, again, if you're at the bottom of page seven, um, the existing list includes things like race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, place of birth, so it would add genetic information in there. Um, while this is not currently in Vermont law, uh, the federal GINA, which it sounds like has been discussed here already, does include employment discrimination provisions for any employer with 15 or more employees. So this would effectively, from an employment perspective, be bridging the gap for those small employers in Vermont who have less than 15 employees that they would also be subject to those non-discriminatory, just non-discrimination provisions. Um, our office has what's called a work sharing agreement with the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So any law in which there's both a federal and a state law that corresponds, um, our state office can also investigate on behalf of the EEOC effectively and, and they can approve our decision so that there's not two uh, concurrent investigations going on. So this would then bring a genetic information under the purview of what our office would also um, be able to enforce. I spoke with folks in our office in my two years with the, with the unit. We have not seen any inquiries to our office specifically based on employment discrimination based on genetic information. Julio Thompson, our director, who has been in his role for about 10 years, has not, uh, is not aware of, of a specific genetic information complaint either. That being said, because we didn't have that enforcement, we sometimes would look at these things through the lens of disability law because a lot of times there might be overlap between um, what might be considered genetic information in someone with a, a disability or a perception of a disability which is currently within our enforcement authority. Um, and I guess I would add backtracking, the definition here um, seems to effectively be the same definition as in Gina when it comes to employment discrimination, so there's not a lot of difference there, so it would truly be, be backfilling there. Um, so given all of that, we are generally in support, despite the lack of complaints we've received specifically on genetic information, we are generally in support of adding that to the employment discrimination provisions. Um, you know, it would allow our work sharing agreement with the EEOC to include um, genetic information, something we would normally, if someone truly had a genetic information complaint, that did not fall under disability discrimination, we would have to send them to the federal EEOC um, for that investigation, we couldn't do it. So in, in addition, it would cover that um, zero to 15 employee employer. Um, employees of that business would also have those protections of the law. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This is very helpful. Great. Good. All right, any questions? So, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, you're referring to page seven. Are you referring to the Fair Employment Practices yes. Act itself? Okay. Correct. Four, uh, yes. 21495. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good luck, Eliza. Thank you. And thank you for uh, your attention. Thank, thank you for your work. Well. And you know, listen, it would be extremely helpful if we could get what you have, your testimony electronically. Is it possible between? Uh, I will talk to Sherry and confirm that we That'd can be get great. back into it by the end of the day. Excellent. So, good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Falco. Schilling. Good morning. Well, good morning. Um, so my name is Falco Schilling. I'm the Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, this is my first time getting to come in front of this committee in that role, but I've had the pleasure to work with many of you in other capacities before. Um, so, just uh, very briefly, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today and say that the ACLU of Vermont uh, supports S197. Um, individuals, as you have heard, might want to get their genetic information for a lot of different reasons, uh, many of them having to do with the ability to address medical issues, um, and that, but there's also a fear of how that information will be used, and, and we think that that fear in itself could have a chilling effect on folks trying to get that testing, trying to get that information proactively that could have a really positive impact on their lives. And so, just very briefly, uh, we support this legislation and think it would be a positive step forward for the state. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Okay. Questions? All right. That was simple. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you all. So, uh, this is um, this is all really good information, and we're it's now been put into our individual brains. Uh, we will come back to this bill this week, uh, so we can make a decision about how to go forward. And so that will probably be, um, is today Wednesday? Yeah, it'll be either Thursday or Friday, so. Uh, <laughs> I can't, I can't uh, say any more than that at this point. Uh, but if, uh, what I would ask the committee to do is to uh, go through the testimony that we've heard and then to uh, go through the bill again and think about questions that we might have for Damien so we can um, make any proposals of amendment that make sense. I do know that there are three other states that have passed similar uh, legislation for life and disability. Um, so I'll try and get that information to everybody as well. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. We're gonna now clear the room for the next. And thank you, uh, Dr. Wood, are you still there? I, I am, thank you. We're going to say goodbye. Thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. So, Katie, thank you for being here. We have a new, uh, or at least a, a proposal um, for this bill, 295. And you want to show us what we've got. This draft what? There's a, an amendment, draft 1.1, 1 .1, and the new language is highlighted. So I should say Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel for the record. Um, so we're looking at 295, which is the PFAS bill, and where the changes are in section two, which is the section pertaining to the food packaging specifically. Um, in the, thank you, page six. Um, in the bill as introduced, there's language that prohibits, um, so the person shall not manufacture, sell, offer for sale, distribute for sale, or distribute for use in this state a food package to which PFAS have been intentionally added in any amount. Um, so that's language in the bill is introduced. And then the proposed change um, is highlighted in yellow. So this is new language that wasn't in the bill is introduced. Um, the language I just read would be struck through. And instead, there would be um, a directive for um, rulemaking. And actually, I should back up. Um, it's not so much as a, of a directive because the language is may adopt rules instead of shall adopt rules. If you see at the top of page seven, the Department of Health may adopt rules uh, prohibiting a manufacturer, supplier, or distributor from selling or offering for sale or for promotional distribution of food package or um, the packaging component of a food package to which PFAS have been intentionally added in any amount greater than an incidental presence. So I'm gonna pause here again, and this is something I noted yesterday, that um, the phrase intentionally added in any amount greater than an incidental presence. This language just differs a little bit from the language you have in the bill with regard to um, firefighting foam and carpets, which just, which just says intentionally added, and there's um, language here in any uh, greater amount than incidental presence. Um, so there's a policy decision for you there, and I just wanted to flag that it's treated differently in two different areas. This section goes on to say that the department may only prohibit the manufacturer, supplier, or distributor from selling or offering for sale or for promotional distribution of food package or the packaging component of a food package in accordance with A that we just went over if the department determines that a safer alternative is readily available in sufficient quantity and at a comparable cost and the safer alternative performs as well or better than PFAS in a specific application of PFAS to a food package or packaging component of a food package. And then next in subdivision two, the department, if the department does adopt one of these rules um, that would prohibit the selling, offering for sale, or promotional distribution, the prohibition could not take effect until two years after the department determines that a safe determines that a safer alternative to PFAS product is available. So to summarize, the bill is introduced, has kind of a straight prohibition. And this um, is kind of backs off of that and says that the department may adopt rules 
to prohibit certain food packaging items, but if they do so, there have to be um, safer alternatives at a comparable cost that perform as well. And if the department finds that and determines that they're going to do a prohibition, it can't take place till two years after their determination was first made. And the two year period is consistent with what we've done on children's products, I think. What's in transfer? So uh, this, this language comes from Maine. Maine. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it's, it's not written in stone yet, but I think it's important for us to consider um, there are a number of folks who have been talking about the lack of containers for certain products. We don't want to open up Pandora's box, on the other hand, and allow for PFAS to be used everywhere all the time, because it's not, a, would not be a healthy situation, but we do want to be considerate of what's happening out there in the real world. Do we, so, will we hear about examples of? I'm, well, we've got testimony coming up, so I wanted us to be aware of this before the testimony. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good work. And, I, and by the way, I did send this out, Katie sent it out to the Department of Health, mm -hmm. so we need to hear what their thoughts are on it as well. They may want to change it from May to Shell. I don't know. They may not. Can I assume you took testimony on this while I was gone? We're taking testimony on it right now. Yeah, because it's changed. Uh, this has changed. Yes. Oh. This is from Maine. Yeah. Yes. yes. Right. Oh. Based on some concerns that we had heard. Yes. Okay. So we have folks on the telephone, and Dory's going to bring them up for us um, in order. Eileen? Well, they're all thought together. They're all on together. Yes, oh, they're well. all one phone number. They're all in one place, just to make it a lot. Oh, the yeah. American Chemical Council. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We, we got three. And I think they're going to have different things to talk about. But Fine. This is and good. And then there's another person who is expecting a we call. We could do all, all our work like this, and then we would have six foot. So well, then there's oh, yes. some stuff happening with that. So yeah. at any rate. <laughs> Uh, it, it would, it know, would be so good if, uh, if it was valid. I know, I know. Okay, wait on Let's that. try again. Yeah, hang on a second. You, I'm going to go look because I might have reversed the numbers because like I think so. Senator Lyons uh, with the Senate Health and Welfare Committee in Vermont. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. And I'm, I'm thinking we're talking with Eileen Keneally, Laura Brust, and Renee Lani. Is that right? That's correct. Terrific. Um, you are with us uh, around the table are Senators Cummings, Senator Westman, Senator Ingram, Senator McCormick and then interested folks in the room. Uh, we are taking testimony on S-295 and we uh, will open it up for you to provide that testimony. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, my name is Laura Bruff. I am Assistant General Counsel of the American Chemistry Council and I am testifying today on behalf of ACC's polycarbonate BPA Global Group in opposition to proposed restrictions in S-295 related to the use of bisphenols in food packaging. Bisphenol A, which is also known as BPA, is used primarily in the manufacture of polycarbonate plastic and epoxy resin. Polycarbonate plastic is a shatter-resistant, lightweight, high-performance plastic with toughness, optical clarity, high heat resistance, and excellent electrical resistance. Common uses of polycarbonate plastic include protective and corrective eyewear, sports safety equipment, automobiles, compact discs and DVDs, medical devices, food and storage containers, and electronic equipment. Epoxy resins are used to coat metal cans and containers to prevent corrosion, especially when intended for acidic foods. 
These findings create a protective barrier essential to public health to prevent, prevent canned foods from becoming spoiled or contaminated with bacteria or rust. Epoxy resins have many other uses and can be found in cars, boats, and planes, and as components in fiber optics and electrical circuit boards. While BPA is used to make polycarbonate plastics and epoxy resins, it is consumed when the plastic or resin is manufactured, and only trace residual levels are present in the finished material. BPA is not intentionally added to food packages, and at most would only be incidentally present as a trace level impurity. Polycarbonate plastic and epoxy resins have been approved for decades by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the European Food Safety Authority, and numerous other government agencies worldwide for use in food contact applications. Attached to my written testimony is a fact sheet providing additional information on these government reviews of BPA safety. In February 2018, the U.S. National Toxicology Program released the result of the Clarity Core Study, the largest study ever done on BPA and conducted by scientists at the Food and Drug Administration. Clarity is a multi-pronged U.S. federal government research program designed to assess the potential health effects of long-term exposure to BPA. The Clarity Core study expanded on an earlier FDA-conducted study that found no health effects from BPA at typical consumer exposure levels. This prior study assessed the potential for BPA exposure to cause health effects in the offspring of rats exposed to BPA in the womb and through the early developmental stages of life after birth. The Clarity Core study further assessed the potential for BPA to cause health effects over a longer period of time. Rats began exposure to BPA while in the womb, and exposure to BPA continued over their entire lifetime after birth. The Clarity Core study's principal investigator has stated that, quote, BPA did not elicit clear biologically plausible adverse effects at levels remotely close to typical consumer exposure levels. In a statement released in conjunction with the study's draft report, Dr. Stephen Ostroff, Deputy Commissioner for Foods and Veterinary Medicine at FDA said, quote, our initial review supports our determination that currently authorized uses of BPA continue to be safe for consumers. The Clarity Program builds upon the work of earlier U.S. federal government studies that collectively provide a clear understanding of the potential for BPA to cause health effects. In recent years, more than 20 significant studies by U.S. government researchers have been published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. The findings from these preceding studies tell us that consumer exposure to BPA is extremely low and that BPA is rapidly, rapidly eliminated from the body. Based on these results, it can be predicted that BPA is unlikely to cause health effects. The results of the Clarity Core study confirm there is no risk of health effects from BPA at typical human exposure levels, even if people are exposed to BPA throughout their lives. Attached to my written testimony is a fact sheet providing additional information on the Clarity Core study. Based on the foregoing, we oppose the proposed restrictions in SP95 related to the use of bisphenols in food packaging. Thank you for your time. So, do we have your testimony? We, we don't have our, we have to refresh. Just hold on a minute, thank you. Okay, is it under Renee's name? That's not the testimony I received. Laura. I don't Laura. Know. I don't have Renee's name. We don't have it yet. Okay, uh, we don't have your testimony for some reason. It's under Renee, and we have Renee's name on it, so that's what I did. Sorry, I was answering other emails at the time and didn't do that. Oh, here we have it. it. Okay, good, Renee. we've got it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. All right, sorry for the confusion for a minute. So you're testifying uh, basically on um, the, the bill section, page 8. For us, seven and eight um, lines, eighteen through twenty on seven, and then lines one and two on eight, um, and concerns about 
bisphenols that have been intentionally added in any amount greater than an incidental presence. That is correct, right. Okay, and so any food package. Okay. Questions? Is the difference, it may have been added, but then during the process, it becomes an incidental presence? I think that's the testimony I heard. Can you clarify that, please? Did you hear the question? I did. Um, okay. So BPA is used in the manufacture of polycarbonate and epoxy resins, but it's not intentionally added to those products themselves. So during the course of the manufacture, the BPA would be consumed in, in the process and wouldn't be intentionally added to the end product itself. It would only be available at, at most at trace, at trace amount. So the difference between what you're saying and what the bill says is what? I think what the bill is saying um, is that you know, bisphenols are added to food packaging um, at, you know, for, for a purpose in the package itself. And that, at least for the case of bisphenol A, is, is not the case. It is, not, it, it is only used as a, as a component of the manufacturing. I guess it would be great to have a, fo a picture of this. Okay. Are we Press. talking Tupperware or are we talking, because uh, when you say added to, mm -hmm. I, I see a coating on the inside of the, tomato. of the tomato can. Right. What I think the difference is, we're saying is it is intentionally added to the start of the process, but by the time they come to the final consumer product, there's only a trace amount left. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And so that would and be incidental? Correct. And, and this is an, an FDA approved food contact use. And, and just to clarify, polycarbonate would not be used in Tupperware. Um, okay. Polycarbonate I is just a, don't a hard, clear plastic. Okay. Any other questions? What, how would you change the language so that we don't capture, uh, it sounds like we're not capturing what you're talking about. So we'll have to clear, make sure that we understand that. I, I, I would propose uh, removing this million off from, this, from the bill altogether. Fix a lot. Okay. Thank you. All right. So you want to remove it all because you're, you're obviously you represent an industry that uh, produces and utilizes BPA, and there are effective uses for that um, chemical, but it, it also has certain deleterious health effects. So our, we're, we're 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 working together indifferently, but uh, our goal here is to ensure some pu basic public health. Uh, protections. So um, we do appreciate your testimony and uh, we understand that, we do understand that some of these chemicals are critically important for our uh, plastic industry. At the same time, in the work that we've done previously, we understand its persistence in the environment and its, um, its effect, especially at developmental stages. Okay, yes. I'm just looking at the definition of intentionally added. Yes. And that says the addition of a chemical in a product that serves an intended function in the product's component. There's a, I think what we've got is there's adding it at the beginning when you start mixing all this stuff up. You heat it, it burns off and by the, or whatever. And by the time you get to the end, there's only trace elements in the end product, as opposed to some of the things like my dental floss, and which it is an outside coating. Right, or the and coating in your tomato can. 
Well, last time we did that, uh, we got stuff about it was preventing botulism, right? Which is also and it, it hasn't that hasn't changed that piece has no, it? it hasn't, and I don't know that I want to ban. You don't want to ban botulism. I want to, yeah. So it's I more immediately, and <laughs> Senator, I hear what you're saying, and what I'd like to do is to uh, see if there are any other questions for for um, Laura or Eileen or Renee who are also on the phone. Any other questions? Because we'll, we'll say we'll come back to this one. Okay. And, and Eileen and Renee oh. have, have additional comments to make. Please do. Oh. <clears throat> so I'll start if that's OK. Yes, please uh, go ahead. Great. So good morning. My name is Eileen Keneally, and I'm also from the American Chemistry Council. And I'm testifying on behalf of the American Chemistry Council High Phthalates Panel. The proposed legislation seeks to impose restrictions on the manufacture, sale, and distribution of food packaging to which phthalates have been intentionally added in any amount greater than incidental presence. The legislation seeks to prohibit all orthophthalates from use in food packaging, including phthalates such as diisononal and diisodecal, which we call DINP and DIDP. And these phthalates are currently permitted for use in food packaging in the U.S. and across the globe, and there's overwhelming evidence of the safety when used in components of food packaging. The term phthalates represents a large family of chemicals that happen to be structurally similar, but which are functionally and toxicologically different. While all orthophthalate esters share the same functional group, the carbon chain lengths of the alcohols are significantly different and this is very important to understand their safe use. Phthalates can be categorized as high and low depending on their molecular weight. The low molecular weight phthalates have three to six carbon atoms in their backbone, and the high molecular weight phthalates such as DINP and DIDP have seven or more carbon atoms in their backbone. <clears throat> because of concerns in animal studies, some of the low molecular weight phthalates have been classified is likely to cause adverse effects to reproduction in the European Union. However, DINP and DIDP, which are high molecular weight phthalates, have undergone rigorous regulatory review in the EU and around the world, and they are not classified for any human health or environmental hazards and are considered safe for use without restriction. DINP and DIDP have been evaluated for potential reproductive and developmental toxicity for over 20 years. Most recently, in March of 2018, after a three-year review, the European Chemicals Agency concluded that no classification for DINP for either effects on sexual function or fertility or developmental tox is warranted. Similarly, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission completed a thorough hazard assessment on the potential of DIDP to impact reproductive fertility and found that there was no concern with exposure to children, pregnant women, or any susceptible individuals. As a result, the IDP in children's toys and childcare articles is no longer restricted in the U.S. There's no evidence for any other alleged adverse effects with DIP or DIDP, and this is evidenced by the lack of classification for any endpoint. With regard, re regard specifically to food contact uses, the U.S. FDA is currently reviewing a petition to revoke existing U.S. food contact clearances for 30 orthophthalates, and they're reviewing a food additive petition from the flexible vinyl industry requesting that FDA amend the food additive regulations to no longer provide for the use of 26 orthophthalates because those uses have been abandoned. A U.S. FDA report on the use of plasticizers <coughs> PVC food packaging concluded that the use of orthophthalates in food packaging in the U.S. is low, as most manufacturers have switched the use of alternative plasticizers. So we would urge the committee to delay any action on Senate 295 pertaining to phthalates until the U.S. FDA has completed its evaluation on these pending petitions. DIMP and DIDP, as I noted, have been subject to rigorous evaluations of potential risk in dietary exposure by regulatory agencies around the world for the last eight years. Without exception, every evaluation has arrived at the same conclusion that there's no health concern for DIP and DIDP in the diet. Uh, just to give an example, and, and all of these are detailed in my written testimony, in December of 2019, the European Food Safety Authority issued an updated risk assessment on five phthalates, including DIMP and DIDP, 
finding current exposure to these five phthalates in food is not a concern for public health. There were similar conclusions by the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, the UK Food Standards Agency, the European Chemicals Agency, uh, the New Zealand Government and Ministry of Primary Industries. Each of these finds that either phthalates in packaged food is not a food safety concern or there's no health concern and current dietary exposures included uh, are not considered to be a health concern. Thus, these risk evaluations provide overwhelming support for conclusion that phthalates, particularly DINP and DIDP, are not a human health concern with dietary exposure around the world. And I would note that in contrast to this proposed bill in Vermont, in Japan it was recently announced that DINP and DIDP were actually placed on their first draft of materials that are permitted for use in food contact materials, and that was in August of last year. Thus, our position is that with respect to phthalates, this bill does not provide any additional health benefit to the citizens of Vermont. Contrary to what some have said in testimony in front of this body, the U.S. is not an outlier with respect to permitting use of DIMP and DIDP in food contact applications. They're permitted in Europe, in the Mercosur countries of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, the permitted in Japan, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, and several other places around the world. Finally, it's important to note that the testimony in the record from April 17th of 2020 from Dr. Marisol Maffini contains numerous inaccuracies and misrepresentations concerning phthalates. I detail these in my written comments, but I'd like to highlight a few for you this morning. On page three, she has stated that all of the phthalates that were approved by FDA were approved before 1985, and although the scientific knowledge has advanced, there hasn't been a reevaluation of their safety since 1985. These statements are misleading and incorrect. Most of these 28 phthalates have been phased out. Only four remain in food contact application today. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I noted, FDA is currently reviewing a petition on phthalates in food contact, and many of these uses have long since been abandoned. As part of its review, FDA recently released a report on its investigation of the use of plasticizers in PVC, concluding that the use of orthophthalates in food packaging in the United States is quite low. Additionally, as I just noted, there have been numerous reevaluations of the safety of phthalates in food packaging by regulatory agencies across the globe in the last 10 years, including in the UK, the EU, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. None of these has found a public health concern, and most continue to permit the use of phthalates in food packaging. Uh, additionally, the testimony from Dr. Maffini stated on page three that FDA doesn't have limits to how, many how much phthalates can be present in food, and because they're not tightly bound, they migrate easily. This statement wrongly implies there's no regulatory oversight on how phthalates are used in food packaging. This is not true. For example, FDA has specifications for how DIMP can be used in food packaging and restricts the use at levels of no more than 43% in food contact, PVC, and only when used with non-fatty and low alcohol foods. It's almost identical to the specification in the EU. With respect to the ability of phthalates to migrate into foods, we would note that that's not specific to phthalates. All plasticizers theoretically are able to migrate to food. However, phthalates like DIMP and DIDP are tightly bound to the PVC and do not migrate easily. Um, furthermore, on page four, the doctor notes that academic studies have linked these chemicals to various reproductive, developmental, and endocrine health problems. Uh, these statements are incorrect. As noted previously, DIMP is not considered to be a reproductive toxicant in the EU, Australia, or Canada. The US CPSC also confirmed in 2017 that DIDP is not, an is not uh, anti-androgenic and is of negligible concern for children, pregnant mothers, and other susceptible populations. Uh, furthermore, on page four of her testimony, um, the doctor noted that CPSC had advice to permanently ban eight phthalates due to an increased health risk in children. This is incorrect. Although CPSC made permanent a ban on DIMP in toys and child care articles, they removed the ban on DIDP and DIMP in toys and child care articles 
as it found, as I noted, that posed no risk to children, pregnant women, or other susceptible individuals. Um, I would also note that uh, Dr. Maffei noted that the European Chemicals Agency evaluated the cumulative risk of phthalates, so on and so forth, and she noted that they estimated a tolerable daily intake, but what she did not uh, note in her testimony was the result of those evaluations where ECRA found that there was no risk expected from combined exposure to DINP and DITP for children exposed via food and the indoor environment. EFSA, which is the European Food Safety Agency, published its safety assessment just this past December, concluding that current exposure to these five phthalates from food is not a concern. I would also note that um, she has noted that FDA has not taken any measures to deal with phthalates in food. Uh, we counter this statement as misleading, and it suggests that other food safety regulatory agencies have restricted the use of phthalates in food packaging, and that U.S. FDA somehow is an outlier in not taking measures. In fact, as I've noted, all major food safety regulatory agencies around the world continue to maintain the use of phthalates in food packaging, um, safe for all current uses. Finally, I would note that um, Dr. Maffei notes uh, on page five that uh, petition from the public interest groups to FDA demonstrated when the cumulative effects of chemicals in the diet are considered as required by law, that FDA cannot conclude the use of the food contact is safe. Uh, I maintain that this statement is counter to the conclusions in the more than five risk assessments conducted by independent food safety agencies around the world, including EFSA, Health Canada, Food Safety Australia New Zealand, the New Zealand MPI, the UK and Ireland Food Safety Authority. Each of those finding no appreciable public health risk, low exposure, etc., with the use of high molecular weight phthalates in food packaging. In conclusion, we recognize and support the efforts of the Vermont legislature in protecting the consumer However, it's important that this effort is based on information that's accurate and provides tangible health benefits to the consumer. There's overwhelming evidence that high molecular weight phthalates like DIMP and DIDP in particular have been proven safe in food contact applications all over the world. In this regard, we urge the committee to exclude the blanket prohibition on phthalates in the current legislation. And what we would suggest uh, on page seven of the proposed bill is that if you're going to move forward with uh, a ban that you would add language saying the prohibition will not apply to any uses of phthalates in food contact material authorized by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we frequently do get um, battling testimony in here, one side against the other, and you uh, brought it to a new level. But we thank you for your due diligence in uh, going through the uh, work that we've already heard about. And we will continue to take testimony. I uh, seriously do appreciate the work that you've done on this. And, uh, but also understanding, uh, naturally, that you do represent a specific interest group. And so we need to keep that in mind. So, But we do appreciate what you've done. And uh, the the work, especially in the EU, is, a, is important to all of us, I think, because of the, we in this country use grass or generally regard it as safe, and uh, the EU um, does more of a precautionary process. So perhaps we should move toward the EU altogether. I don't know. Would that be something that the American Chemical Council would support? Um, we support science-based decision-making, and you'll see in my written testimony that I've referenced the many extensive risk evaluations done by regulatory agencies, including in the EU. Okay. So um, do we have the testimony that you just provided? Because I don't see it on my page. Do we have that? Refresh under NS under uh, more first. I am well, we'll refresh it one more time. Everything okay. I, uh, At my I put under one person. Okay. Yes. Questions? Questions? So your concern is about a specific class of the, um, the high molecular weight chemicals? Correct. I, you know, ACC's uh, stance, which I believe my colleagues would agree, is that each chemical needs to be evaluated on its own. And if you look at the 
regulatory agencies around the world that have evaluated phthalates in food contact material. They've always looked at each chemistry on its own merits and all the, you know, 30 years of scientific testing on phthalates to come to their conclusions. And that is why it's still authorized for use in the U.S., in the EU, and in many other countries. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank I'm, you. I'm sure we're going to hear testimony, further testimony, and we're going to have to put this together and balance our decision between what you presented and what we continue to hear. What we, and uh, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Others in the, around the table want to ask a question? Is there any more testimony that you have? I don't want to leave anyone out. Yes, uh, this is Renee Laney. We have uh, one more testimony, so um, if the committee is ready, I can begin. Okay. And okay. are you providing it? Yes. yes. All right. So, good. good morning, members of the committee. My name is Renee Laney, and I'm also here on behalf of ACC. The chemical industry supports a comprehensive approach to managing per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, which are at issue in this bill, and that helps to protect and, ins uh, and ensure the protection of human health and the environment. This includes appropriate science-based policies and regulations. S-295, as drafted, seeks to regulate or ban several different types of products containing PFAS. Uh, for the reasons I'll outline, we oppose S-295. PFAS used in today's products are important to modern life and are a key enabling technology. The strong fluorine carbon bond allows PFAS to provide products with strength, durability, stability, and resilience. These properties are critical to the reliable and safe functioning of a broad range of products that are important for industry and consumers. PFAS play a vital role in everything from lowering emissions and improving safety, reliability, and fuel efficiency in automobiles to manufacturing semiconductors, solar panels, and high-performance electronics. Many other industries also depend on high-performance PFAS, including aerospace, alternative energy, healthcare, building and construction, chemicals and pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, just to name a few. Regulation or legislation should not group all PFAS together or take a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach. PFAS are a diverse family of chemistries that includes a broad range of substances with different physical, chemical, and toxicological properties and uses. Hence, the hazard and risk profile of various PFAS chemistries are very different. It is, the, it is neither scientifically accurate nor appropriate to group all PFAS together or take a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach to this wide range of substances. This will deter innovation, undermine effective product design, and may even lead to the elimination of an entire chemistry that is an enabling technology for a broad array of vital products. It is important to recognize that most of the attention to date on PFAS has been focused on a handful of substances that are no longer produced in the U.S., Europe, or Japan. Additionally, significant regulations, including the Wattenberg Chemical Safety Act, are already in place for new and existing chemicals and specific actions have already been taken to help manage PFAS. This includes the U.S. EPA's Comprehensive National PFAS Action Plan, as well as other actions initiated by various agencies. In addition, manufacturers and many users of PFAS are implementing a variety of practices and technologies to help minimize environmental emissions. These ongoing actions should be factored into any additional efforts to assess and regulate this broad class of chemistries. The scientific and safety data on specific PFAS substances should also be used to guide public policy. Effective chemical regulation, regardless of the substance, includes consideration of a chemical's hazard characteristics, its use, and actual levels of exposure to assess the potential risk of a particular chemical and determine the most appropriate risk management measures. These fundamental principles have unfortunately been lost in the current debate about PFAS chemistry. Taking an overly broad and non-scientific approach to PFAS will make it difficult to implement effective regulatory policies. It will also impact an extensive source of the economy, including a broad range of industries, businesses, public entities like airports, hospitals, drinking water facilities, and municipalities. For these reasons, different PFAS require different regulatory approaches. Furthermore, state action should be conducted within or consistent with appropriate regulatory frameworks. 
Vermont has designed a robust regulatory system and established policies for managing chemicals within the state, including PFAS. These frameworks ensure consistent, science-based regulatory approaches and provide transparency, broad stakeholder input, and enforceable regulations. We support establishing clear timelines to ensure that policy decisions and regulatory outcomes are completed and implemented in a timely fashion. But by bypassing or ignoring established regulatory authorities and predetermining regulatory outcomes undermines the regulatory process. And it establishes a dangerous precedent for addressing other chemical issues in the future and prevents policymakers from focusing or pressing issues of public concern. Um, in my written testimony, which you hopefully should have, I've also provided additional reasoning for each of the sections um, outlined in the bill. Um, I'm going to provide a very quick high level for each of those um, right now, but I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Um, for the portion regarding aqueous film forming foams, AFFF, or what, the firefighting foams with intentionally PFAS, um, we have concerns with the way that portion of the bill is drafted. Uh, I think we've seen legislation passed in other states that takes a more appropriate um, approach, which is putting requirements for best practices on the end users to help minimize emissions by ensuring that firefighters, as well as those who have high risk of Class B flammable liquid fires, have the appropriate tools available to them in emergency situations. Um, while also preventing emissions to the environment in non-emergency situations. Uh, for food packaging, and I think this goes to the discussion before, FDA has a significant regulatory process in place. Um, for instance, the PFAS chemistries do not go through the grass process, as you noted earlier. They go through the food contact notification process. So um, not all food contact chemistries go through the generally regarded as safe process in FDA. Um, and I've outlined in my comments the robust process that FDA uses um, to determine whether or not something should be used in food contact. As far as carpets and rugs, uh, no other state has passed such a piece of legislation that would outright ban an entire group of chemistries indiscriminately from a product sector. Uh, any state to have looked at this have gone through a regulatory process and we would encourage Vermont to do the same. Um, and then finally, the chemicals of high concern to children, the addition of the entire class of PFAS to the, this list. Again, no other state has passed such broad legislation. Um, because PFAS chemistries are a family of uh, different chemistries with different properties, many chemistries that are classified as PFAS would actually not qualify for the regulatory processes outlined and the criteria. Um, that Vermont has, the legislature has detailed for the addition of new chemistries to that list. Um, if the state is interested in pursuing addition of certain PFAS chemistries to that list, we would encourage them using the regulatory process that the legislature um, has helped enable to be put into place. Um, so in conclusion, for all of the reasons that stated and everything provided in my testimony to the committee, uh, we would ask you to oppose S-295. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? So uh, as I'm looking at, at some of the comments that you have uh, with regard to the FDA in particular and uh, its regulatory scrutiny over intended use and then level of toxicity, what type of clinical studies go on uh, that would suggest uh, a clean bill of health, for example, or not? Um, so, you know, every chemistry is going to be different. Um, so I can kind of talk a little bit to specifically some of the PFAS chemistries that have gone through. FDA has, you know, I'm not, I'm not a company and those happening on a company by company basis, but FDA has the ability to request as much information as they want before these chemistries are introduced to the market. Um, basically, FDA needs to be comfortable with allowing that chemical to be introduced to the market. Uh, I know some of the studies that have been provided by my companies to FDA include cancer assays, reproductive health assessments, um, general toxicity studies. So it really covers the floors of um, information that FDA may look to, and they're also um, allowed to continue asking um, for uh, additional information as, um, you know, 
as as FDA requires to continue to remain on market. Uh, that being said, you know FDA has exercised its ability to remove chemistries from market historically, and there's only certain PFAS chemistries that are on use. It's a pretty small number. Um, of PFAS that are actually approved for use um, in different food contact applications. Okay, thank you. Other questions? No. Thank okay. you. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, is uh, is there more testimony? No, that's all we have. That's good. You have a lot. Uh, we appreciate it, and if you have distinguished a couple things for us, and we do appreciate that. So. Um, we are moving on to our next person, so we are going to say goodbye to you and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good. Next one is also a phone call. Okay, and do we have his? Whatever has been sent to me is, okay. is online. So it's Stuart Holmes, and I don't, the Chief Scientist of the American so Forest and Paper know. Association. Good morning, Stuart. This is Senator Lyons, uh, Vermont Health, uh, Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Hi. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome. You are sitting here with us around the table, our Senator Cummings, Senator Westman, Senator Ingram, and Senator McCormick. And we are hearing testimony on S95. We don't have anything from you in writing, do we? Yes. No? No? Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, well, if, if we'll listen to your testimony, and then if you could provide it to us electronically, that would be very helpful. Absolutely, Chair. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Go right ahead. Introduce okay. yourself. And go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Weston, and members of the Health and Welfare Committee. My name is Stuart Holm, and I'm the Chief Scientist for the American Forest and Paper Association. I appreciate the opportunity to share our concerns with legislation under consideration by your committee, an act related to restrictions on perfluoroalkyl and per polyfluoroalkyl substances and other chemicals of concern in consumer products. In Vermont, the industry employs more than 4,500 individuals with an annual payroll of nearly 151 million. Estimated state and local taxes paid by the forest products industry totals $14 million annually. I'd like to focus on Section 2, where this bill seeks to ban food packaging that contains any amount or type of intentionally added PFAS or bisphenols. AFNPA members are committed to ensuring the safety of their products, including the safety of chemicals used in their manufacturing processes. AFNPA believes that the chemical and product-related legislation and regulations should be protective of health, cost-effective, and based on the best available science. We support continued research on the safety of PFAS and bisphenols in our products. We believe the state should avoid duplicative regulatory efforts. Chemicals and products and manufacturing byproducts should be regulated at the federal and not the state level. It is essential that products moving in interstate commerce be subject to uniform standards. Senate Bill 295 bans food packaging that contains bisphenols in any amount greater than its incidental presence. Let's talk about the most commonly discussed bisphenol, that is BPA. The, major the majority of BPA exposure is from food. The Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, their current perspective based on its most recent safety assessment is that BPA is safe at the current levels occurring in foods. To date, no states have directly linked exposure to BPA with cancer in humans, and animal studies support this. Various scientific groups, including the U.S. National Toxicology Program, or NTP, and the European Union, therefore concluded that BPA is not a carcinogen. Switching to PFAS, as written, S-295 also bans the intentional use of any type of PFAS in food packaging. The FDA has stated that it has, quote-unquote, carefully reviewed the available science 
on the short chain PFAS compounds and has not identified any safety concerns. Additionally, the FDA's careful study and approval of the use of short chain PFAS chemicals based on the best available science allows for continued production of safe and reliable food packaging. On this basis, we believe FDA regulated food packaging utilizing PFAS chemistry should be exempt from additional legislation or regulations. Of the thousands of PFAS chemicals that exist, and I've heard it's been up to 5,000, there is a short list of compounds, less than 20, that the FDA specifically reviewed and approved for food packaging applications based on thorough testing and risk-based assessments. However, as S295 is currently written, FDA-approved PFAS in food packaging would also be banned. We recommend that S295 be amended to fix this oversight. So in conclusion, the committee should realize the unintended consequences of enacting this bill. Specifically, the bill would have a significant impact on the Vermont's economy and population as it would penalize the sale of many food packaging items sold in the state. We encourage the committee to avoid measures that might penalize paper products. We look forward to continuing our work with the state of Vermont, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions from the committee? So, what, what, uh, yes, do you have questions? No, I said I heard. No, okay. Um, one of the comments that you made was that uh, at least one of the chemicals of concern that we're looking at doesn't cause cancer. I think it was BPA. But right. yes, but you also understand that there are other neurodevelopmental or um, concerns that are associated with that chemical as well as others. So it is isn't. I, you know, yeah. the, the, the FDA in their 2014 review of over greater than 300 scientific studies um, I, I think it'd be very useful for the committee to review um, what FDA has done. I think you'll come up with a, a different conclusion in terms of human exposure to BPA. Thank you. I think many of us have already reviewed that, but we'll go back again. And uh, I do appreciate your comments and your insight into um, an industry that we have in the state and how it might be affected. Very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, we'll say goodbye and thank you very much and um, wish you well. well. Thank you very much. Bye. Wish you well also. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Red button, Senator. I got back in time. Good work. My job. <laughs> I got back just in the nick of time. Okay. Well, that's a lot of information. I think we have a couple other folks who we may be hearing from. Uh, tomorrow what we wanted we, if we're going to do something on this bill we do it by by Friday so we'll go through and think about what's been said I know there's a lot of chemistry in here uh, that is it's above my pay grade right have we and I, I gather you, you must have taken testimony while I was in New York but have we heard from the firefighting equipment and is it available and we did hear from the firefighters association. No, oh, the equipment. equipment did we haven't heard from the equipment people. Um, I think that might. We'll try and get some. I mean, I don't want to tell them they can't use what they've got and then find out it's going to cost my volunteer fire department a hundred thousand dollars or a million to replace. We'll do what we can do. Yeah. If you have any suggestions. No. Okay. No. We'll I'm not saying the they can make rules. Yeah, we'll if find they out want from the to. firefighters. We'll find out. But I think they have the power to make rules. Who? The health department. They do. We don't have to give it to them. Well, they're coming back to us with their comments, so that no, we set this up. To them. It's the firefighting equipment. I know the union. Yes. Would. Yes. Definitely like us to tell the town that they have to buy all new equipment. We might want to hear from the lead. Great. We haven't heard from them yet, but we will. Yeah. Okay, good. We'll do that. All right, anybody else? The equipment people, all right. Anybody else? 
All right. Um, we will come back to this. The section that is in yellow in the bill, uh, think about that section. I think it does support some of the testimony that we heard. Okay, and the other, you know, the, the other thing is when people start talking about it doesn't cause cancer, remember that there are other things out there yes. besides okay. cancer. Yes, that's, that's, right. that's, that's, that's always becomes the topic of conversation. Yes. It could be a neurodevelopmental something or uh, some other. It may not be above your papers, papers, but it is above mine, well, and know. that's why I'd like to leave it to the Department of Health. Right, exactly. But the other thing is that uh, with all the work that we've been through on some of this, we've heard a lot of testimony on these chem chemicals over time. So, so, and I'll leave it to you and your daughter to duke this one out. But. <laughs> okay, so we'll leave this bill, and we because we're going to move on. We have a couple other things we want to back to stem cells. Oh, we're going no, no, we're going back. We're, we're not going back to stem cells right now. Sounds like we're well, Mike, I've got, uh, we have to get Jen downstairs to talk about one bill. And Katie is here, so we're going to use her expertise mm -hmm. while she's here on 218 and 185. Very good. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, if you need to take a break, this is the time. All right. So we're back on the record. And we're on S185, and we have Christine Vadovec, who's a lecturer at the Rubenstein School to comment on S-185. I'm going to make some general comments. So we'll start with that one, and then we'll go to Katie. Because we have a new edition. Okay. A new draft. And she does have testimony for us. I saw this. This is Senator Lyons in the Vermont Senate Health and Welfare Committee. How are you? Hi, Senator Lyons. I can just barely hear you. I have a little bit of um, static breaking you up right now. Oh, okay. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to shout. Um, you're sitting here with Senator Cummings, Senator Westman, Senator Ingram, and Senator McCormick, uh, and uh, interested parties in the room on S-185, and we have your testimony, so we would ask you to introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony for us. Okay, sure. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Christine Potomac. I teach two courses at the University of Vermont uh, that are directly related to S-185. Um, the first course is Human Health and the Environment, and the second is Climate Change and Human Health. And I've conducted research related to climate and health as a fellow at UVM's Gun Institute for Environment. And I'm also an adjunct research assistant professor at UVM's Larner College of Medicine. And my testimony is that climate change has been described as the biggest public health emergency of our time because of the several risks it poses to human health. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, the World Health Organization, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and our own Vermont Department of Health, in turn, have provided overviews and analysis of the specific climate-related health threats posed globally, nationally, and locally. At the same time, preeminent climate and health scholars have very astutely argued that addressing climate change provides one of the greatest public health opportunities of our time. Many of the actions that can be taken to mitigate climate change are expected to have positive health and economic benefits, thereby offering win-win strategies. For example, increasing active transportation, such as walking and biking, will reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, will improve the health by reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, 
and will provide cost savings, both from avoided emergency room visits and hospitalizations, as well as lost worker productivity that are associated with these diseases. For example, the cost of diabetes treatment alone is estimated at $327 billion every year in the U.S. The CDC has identified eight primary impacts of climate change on human health in the United States. I provided those, the list of those below in the written testimony. From that list from the CDC, the Vermont Department of Health Climate and Health Program has identified seven key impacts of climate change on the health of Vermonters. These include mental health. The impact of climate change can affect mental health in several ways ranging from PTSD associated with extreme events such as flooding to anxiety related to the fear and uncertainty about how climate change will impact everyday life in the future. In a recent study led by my own postdoctoral research fellow at UVM, Christine Carmichael, 92% of Vermonters who were interviewed reported being concerned about climate-related mental health impacts. This made mental health the number one climate-related health concern among Vermonters in our study. Vector-borne diseases is the second area. Tick-borne diseases such as Lyme disease and anaplasmosis, and mosquito-borne diseases such as West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis are both expected to increase in prevalence in Vermont since a warmer climate increases the survival of both those vectors, the ticks and mosquitoes, and the pathogens that they carry. In addition, we expect to see the ranges of different tick species, such as the Lone Star tick, they carry different pathogens, move into Vermont as the climate continues to warm. The third area is water and foodborne diseases. Heavy rainfall events, which are expected to increase in frequency and severity with climate change, can lead to contaminants and infectious diseases entering agricultural fields, private wells, and drinking water systems. Hot weather is the fourth area. In Vermont, we observe a significant increase in emergency department visits when the ambient air temperature rises above 87 degrees Fahrenheit. The number of days above 87 degrees is expected to double by 2050. The fifth area, cyanobacteria, warmer lake temperatures combined with increased heavy rainfall events are expected to increase severity and duration of blue-green algae bloom. Health effects of exposure to these cyanobacteria can range from skin irritation to diarrhea, vomiting, and liver damage. Extreme storm events, the direct health effects of heavy rain events can range from injuries in the short term to illness related to mold growth or contaminated food and water in the long term. And finally, air pollution and pollen. Rising global temperatures are associated with increases in air pollutants such as ground level ozone, wildfire smoke, and pollen that causes allergies. These pollutants can harm respiratory health, particularly among those Vermonters with asthma, which according to the Vermont Department of Health, currently includes 57,000 adults and 9,600 children. In conclusion, each of these climate-related health impacts will benefit from a coordinated response across all Vermont state agencies. And as I stated earlier, many solutions will have co-benefits that can both minimize the harms posed by climate change and improve the health of Vermonters. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify regarding S185. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I hope my statement opens the door to further dialogue as you move forward through the legislative process. Thank you. This is very helpful. I understand that you gave a talk on this uh, subject recently at the yes. College of Medicine, yes. right? And uh, one of our uh, the intern one of our interns was there and heard you speak. Yes, Abby. I, I've met with Abby since then. Good. Right. She's thrilled, as we yeah. are. That's very good. <laughs> She's very good. Yes. So, um, overall, the having a, sort of a general um, bill as S-185 is to help bring uh, regional uh, folks together, you think is a, is a good idea? In a I think, I, I personally do think that it's absolutely a good idea. Um, I am, I'm wondering where you see the possibility of the work that you are doing fitting within the Global Warming Solutions Act where it could potentially bring together more of the agencies and stakeholders, perhaps making health as a special, uh, a special subcommittee under the broader purview of 
global warming solutions act so that we aren't um, kind of pulling pieces apart and having different agencies focusing on things that really truly are related to each other. For example, transportation and health go hand in hand, agriculture and health go hand in hand. And I'm curious um, if there's any possibility for a path forward that would bring more, more people to the table. So that's a very good question. And I think as the Global Solutions uh, Warming Act, Climate Warming Act, that act. Yeah. <laughs> that act goes forward. I call it something. I, I, as that goes forward, um, we'll be in contact with the Committee of Jurisdiction uh, and hoping that they would also add a linkage with uh, public health. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at in this bill in particular is an opportunity to bring all of those folks together at a regional level. So the Chittenden County area where we have a regional planning commission and, yep. we, and we have agriculture, we have transportation issues, and the Planning Commission already does deal with many of those um, resilience efforts. But mm -hmm. this would, this would place um, health care and public health uh, response into the work that the Regional Planning Commission does. So it's, a very, it's much more targeted. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly not separate from what you're talking about at a statewide level. So once you have, once we would have the regional planning commissions across the state working independently and together, because they do work together, mm -hmm. then that would um, suggest exactly what you're saying. So we'll we'll work on both of those. I don't I don't think they're mutually exclusive either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I I absolutely agree with the idea of. Um, whatever recommendations can be made at the state level absolutely would would benefit from being more directed at the local level, knowing that different communities have different threats, particularly, for example, like flood prone communities versus um, other communities that are of higher ground or places close to the lake that may be more impacted by cyanobacteria compared to um, being more up in the mountains where you might have a greater set from tick borne illnesses. So I think that that's absolutely a, a great direction to take with trying to take a more place-based approach. Thank you. Right. I, I think that helps. I know we the equine encephalitis is identified in Addison County and they have the mosquito control program which might be different from what we're seeing. For the tick population control in the Northeast Kingdom where they're where the moose are populated. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of We might differences. ask why they have encephalitis shots for horses and Lyme disease shots for dogs, and we don't have any for humans. There's an encephalitis um, vaccine. Yeah. There may, I mean, I've heard horses. The horses all had to have shots, but mm -hmm. never heard of it showing up in humans. So my understanding is that um, I'm not certain of the history of the um, triple E vaccines for humans. I've not been aware of that at all. I know that there has actually been a Lyme disease vaccine for humans. Um, probably it was Wait. close to 20 years ago, and it was taken off the market by the pharmaceutical manufacturer, um, not because of any evidence based <coughs> suggesting that it was problematic, but because um, there was a group of people uh, in the community um, around the country who claimed that it was causing them to have Lyme disease. There's absolutely no substantiated oh, vaccines, um, but it is something to think about that there is the science for the vaccine, and is it possible to yeah, move into that again, scary. especially now that it would actually become more profitable to those pharmaceutical companies at this point, knowing that many more people are affected and or looking for ways to prevent Lyme disease. Dogs were the primary huh. carriers. carrier ticks right. into the house. That's right. And now I have to check the grandkids, but not the grand puppy. Let me ask you one more question uh, b before uh, we move on, and that is, as you, I'm certain you've read S-185 and it's an introduction, but um, you have listed here seven key impact areas. Yeah. Would you suggest that we include those in the legislation itself or not? 
I personally would include those, um, mainly because that, speaking from a public health standpoint, those areas are where we have very firm evidence that these are the impacts we expect to see, and we know um, that, you know, who are the vulnerable populations for each of these areas, and we have some ideas of um, some of the targeted strategies that could be implemented, um, because that is the way coming down from the U.S. CDC and now filtering through the Department of Health, those are the particular um, areas where we predict to see increases in health concerns. So I would include the ones that we know a lot about, and I, my understanding is that they're very robust. Good. This is helpful. and. And certainly, uh, as you look through those, there are parts of the state that are very much affected by each one. So, mm -hmm. this is helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? None for me. <laughs> okay, you don't have any questions, and I think that folks around the table are satisfied. We, we, we appreciate your taking the time. Uh, to be with us this morning. Thank you very absolutely, much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please do feel free to contact me if I can help in any way. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Take care. Stay safe out there. Yeah, take care. Okay. Yep. Bye, bye bye. Bye. That was good. That was kind of serendipity because mm -hmm. when I had the idea to introduce a bill and I have been keeping in touch with what's going on at the federal level, but nobody was really talking about this locally, but now. <coughs> starting to become important in terms of resilience. Awesome. Katie. Well, shall we go through the bill where it is right now? Yes, yeah, at 2.1. 185, which one? Yeah, what is it? Is it 2.1? 2.1. There are some changes from the last time you've seen it. All right. Okay, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel. So just before we start, does everybody think that her suggestion that we put those seven things in is a good idea? Yeah, I like that. I mean, it's from our own we'll department of health, right? Okay, we'll see where it goes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, so the first section um, creates a chapter, Public Health Response to Climate Change. The first piece of that is the Climate Change Response Plan, and this draft doesn't have any changes to that section since the last time you've seen it. The next section, 1712, at the bottom of page 2, is the Climate Change Response Communication. Um, and there have been changes here. If you remember, this was linking the health department with communication with regional um, uh, planning commissions. And um, so the language now reads that the health department in coordination um, with regional planning commissions, regional management provider, sorry, regional emergency management providers and the citizens assistance registry for emergencies, that's the CARE or, um, project that you heard about last week shall develop a plan to communicate with both Vermont communities and each other for the purpose of mitigating and responding to climate, climate change related to public health risks in Vermont. So the change here, um, using the word coordination and then um, adding to the groups that are, are being consulted and coordinating in that communication plan. At the top of page three, there is language uh, section two, a report. Um, this is just um, directing the health department to submit their plan um, by November 1st of this year. That language has not changed since the last time you've seen it. And then we have, we move um, to what had been um, the concept around S-225, the Regional Planning Commission. So we're kind of transitioning on page three. Um, and now there's new language. There's a sec an existing section um, on the duties of regional planning commissions, and there are two duties being added to regional planning commissions. The first, in subdivision 21, consult with and assist hospitals regarding the development of health needs assessments and other initiatives as needed in accordance um, with 9405A, which is the public participation and strategic planning. We'll look at that section next. And in subdivision 22, consult with and assist the Agency of Human Services, Department of Health, Vermont Emergency Management to incorporate public health and safety concerns related to climate change into state and local emergency and hazard mitigation response and recovery plans. So again, two new duties are proposed for the regional planning commissions. And then now we're moving to section four, which was the cross-reference in um, subdivision 21, the public participation in um, strategic planning in um, title 18. And here, 
we have language that each hospital shall have a protocol for meeting meaningful public participation in its strategic planning process for identifying and addressing healthcare needs that the hospital provides or could provide in its service area. That's existing law. The new language is that regional planning commission shall be available for consultation and assistance pursuant to the language we just looked at. It's just a cross-reference, so no matter where you look, you see that link. Cool. And we're changing the title. Um, so on page five, um, to reflect the fact that you've brought two bills together, um, and it would be an act relating to adopting a climate change response plan and regional planning commission involvement and in, in identifying healthcare related issues or needs. Public work for the regional planning Yes. Yeah. And they're coming in again tomorrow. Okay. Because yeah. I just, I, I think I you were, I, think I was gone. Yeah. 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 Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. yeah. They started this whole thing. Okay. They, they, they uh, contacted me this summer um, and asked to have some of this language put together. So, where would we put all those seven things? Do you think we would put them? Um, can you read the list again? Do you have it right in front of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, it's things like mental health, mm -hmm. vector-borne diseases, water and food-borne diseases, hot weather, cyanobacteria, mm -hmm. extreme storm events, air pollution, and pollen. Those are the things mm -hmm. that have been validated as um, impacts of climate change on the health of Vermonters. Do you want to add it to the list on page two, subdivision two? Mm -hmm. The response plan shall provide actionable strategies specific to both rural and urban communities in the state, including specific strategies that address. And then you have a list A through G. You could add your that list um, that our witness just went over um, to that particular list. Well, maybe we should substitute this list. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's I, you know, because this integrates a lot of different things when you think about it, yeah. you know, if you're saying asthma, that might be transportation, right? maybe. Could we get the health Heat. department to come in and talk about their list? We will. Mm -hmm. That was good. Ask them to do that. Yeah. Right? We have Jared Ulmer coming in tomorrow at 11. Mm -hmm. And Chris Campany of the Wyndham Regional coming in at the same time. In the hospitals. We put the list in. We'll ask. Them. What's the timeline on this? This bill? Well, it, it just hospitals. We've got a little amendment on the floor, and some of us didn't vote for it in committee. But the argument was this is not the time to ask hospitals to do anything because <laughs> they are up to their eyeballs. That's right. And this was a, this was a study. And, That's a good point. Huh? Um, so let's go back and look at that language where just the hospitals when are we're asking them to do this. If it's just adding something to what they already have to do, I think that's fine. But hospitals are currently doing what? They're currently um, they have a they have to have a protocol for meaningful public participation and strategic planning process. Yeah, so they um, can just send a letter or a note and say, "Hello, regional planning commissions, we're having yeah, a hearing." Yeah, no, that's that's fine. That's I just is. want to make sure that we aren't. We'll make sure. I'll talk with them. Being yeah, but. More stuff. I'm Devin on to say it on the record. We've got it. She'll be in the moment. Drag. Huh? <laughs> She'll be here soon. <laughs> Is she coming I'll just back? I'll say what she said. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get her to say it on the record. That's good. Okay, thank you for that. Welcome. So I think this one's moving along nicely. Okay. Um, and then um, it's an important bill, and if it gets incorporated into the that other bill, um, so be it. If not, mm -hmm. that, that other bill moving? I don't know. That's why I'm not keen on I, integrating it. Anyway. I thought I had it, but I don't. Who has it? I assume so economic it. development. No, it's, it's a jobs bill. The Green New Deal? Oh, the no, Green New Deal. No, no, no. The global, my the global, global, warming. global, global warming. warming solution. I don't know yeah. where that is. 218. Yeah. What's an H? Bill? That's an H bill, though. Yeah. So it's got a ways to go. Yeah, that's true. It's uh, also maybe in there. So Katie has brought us a new draft of 218. Um, 
or and, but it is where is where is the information we have to refresh yes, to right. get Commissioner Squirrels. Just to clarify, I'm not bringing you a new draft. No, um, you're not. You're but voting. I know that I'm familiar with the draft that Commissioner Squirrel has sent you. Right. Okay. So and before you begin, we're so looking at S185 and we're asking the hospital association to take a seat <laughs> and answer the question <laughs> as you're doing your outreach, would it, is it to do your hospital planning process, mm -hmm. would it be a cumbersome to add Regional Planning Commission to the list that you communicate with? Um, I believe the Regional Planning Commission shared some language with you that we yes. felt comfortable with. So, this is good to know. Um, what we were hoping is that the, we find the Regional Planning Commission useful. We have some really good partnerships between our hospitals and the Regional Planning Commissions. We would like for them to be available as a resource in our strategic planning, and so that's what we're looking to accomplish with that's this language. That's what we're asking. Great. Perfect. I was just echoing you from yesterday. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> So, serendipity, thank yes. you for coming in. Perfect. Good. Now, back to. Oh my gosh, this is a, a council with W members. How many <laughs> members? Oh, we're good. Oh, we got lots of those. That seems to be the norm. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the bill. You don't do the entire bill. Why do it? 243 is being evaluated now by Doug Ops. They're going to fix a little section of it. I think yeah, what's, we're working with oh, AD, right? Yeah, because I keep saying, what happened to my bill? I came back prepared to present it on the floor. It's an approach. That's where it is. Yeah. And then, and then I was told there were 26 members. I said, no, there's only 20. I was, I was all ready to do the nursing compact. It wasn't yes, on the calendar yet. Where is it actually? Where? Approach. It's an approach. Is it? Yeah. No. Is it? No. I, I know. I, I asked him. No. I have it. We need yeah. to get that thing out. Okay. That's a, that's, a, that's a bill that shouldn't be lost in the in the in the morass. Oh, bills. I know what the problem with that one is. We can't get the drafter this week. Who's the drafter? Betsy Ann. Oh no, that's inappropriate. We were told, I believe that's what Faith told me. We couldn't get the draft. Oh, but we know we've got her one other time, so we're going to try and get it in this week. All right. I think that's it. It's okay. out of the committee of jurisdiction and in a money committee, so it's and it's made not crossover. Sure right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Already made no. It's well, uh, if I get it out by a week from Friday. Wait, yeah. Please. Okay. I still. Have Sorry power. to interrupt. You have power. But we're going to move on to S two eighteen. I should never have brought that up. No, we, this we, language that, that we have in front of us from uh, Commissioner Squirrel. Do you feel comfortable walking through that? Um, I can point out the changes Very to good. you. Um, so there are changes in the membership, specifically um, on page two. There's a representative um, appointed by the insurance plan with the largest number of covered lives in Vermont. I think mm -hmm. a previous version um, had a representative from um, maybe two or three of the largest um, health insurers in the state. So this is um, the largest. Which one is there? It is number R. Uh, thank you. Number Subdivision R. R. Yep. And then okay, in. So it's Subdivision S, two persons who have received mental health services in Vermont appointed by Vermont psychiatric survivors, including one person who has delivered, uh, oops, including, including a person who has delivered care services instead of, oh no, it could, that works as is. Okay. And then um, subdivision T, uh, a family member of a person who has received mental health services appointed by the Vermont chapter of NAMI. And lastly, in subdivision U, one family member of a child who has received mental health services appointed by the Vermont Federation of Families for Vermont's, uh, for, oh, sorry, for children's mental health. Um, and then, um, if you remember the previous version you looked at, it kind of created like an executive committee and then a committee. So that structure is gone here and just has straight membership. And the um, staffing, not the staffing, the chairs have changed. So previously there were co-chairs, 
of the Department of Mental Health and Health. This version has uh, the chair as DMH and the vice chair as the Commissioner of Health. There's also um, some changes. A previous version had a language around ensuring. Um, let's see. At the top, yeah, in subdivision A in the creation, um, a previous version said there is created a mental health integration council for the purpose of ensuring that all sectors of the healthcare system actively participate. So this is saying helping to ensure, and similarly in the purposes and duties of the council, um, one of the powers and duties had been ensuring the implementation of existing law to establish full integration. The language now reads helping to ensure. This is the, remember the, the, the bill that we had, 218, was a placeholder, and then we asked the commissioner to come back with some language that we could send to the house, because I think they may need more work, but go ahead. How many, I've never really seen this before. Any other members the co-chairs deem appropriate? Where is that? On page that's three, page. W. That's w. W. Have you ever seen it? Wait, wait. Is that on hers? I don't have that. I don't have that on the version I'm working on. So I think you're looking on, at a different... Look, one point, one, no, not what no. I'm You're looking, looking at um, commissioner's squirrels. Says commissioner's I, yeah, squirrels. No. <laughs> Go back to your document. Okay. It could be a mile away. Yeah, at the bottom of the document. go through the alphabet yeah, and the numbers. Yeah, but 1.1 does have... I did it the same thing. It does, and that I is something I, I see from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the originally that's what the commissioner had wanted. Yeah. Not under Kate. Okay, good. All right. Let's not put that in. Yeah. No, I saw that and I was like, what's that? That's what we did because we weren't sure. <laughs> You're right, that we knew what we were doing. Okay. Is there still 23? Yes. Well, yes. well actually, there's, 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 there's four. Said, there's two persons on the S. Mm -hmm. S has two. So that All right. Makes well, it good. The W's four. gone. Oh. So <laughs> did they be down the uh, <laughs> B? Goes to be first responders? Huh? Did this speed up the first response? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. By one. By one. Oh, by one. Yeah. Uh, 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 what happened to I, seven to ten? You know, I they're going to get sick of us somewhere down the hall. They're going to say, we've got too many people. That's a lot of per diems. It's not out. There's no per diems. No, they're all what? Why are they all employees? Well, the survivors, they're family the, members. The family members. Well, it's not you. They're going to the family members. 50 bucks a day. Okay. For lunch. And why does it have to be I was getting that 35 years ago as a district commissioner. Oh, yeah. Here is <laughs> I will say that having, re okay. having gone through the whole process this fall, I, I was part, a little bit of it, that having, having this continue, the work continue on mental health makes a whole lot of sense. And the more the merrier, I guess. If Commissioner Squirrel is happy with this, I think. She's willing to testify on the phone right now, but I don't know if we need that. Can I do one small change? Uh oh. It's very tiny. Okay. Uh, letter O, this is executive director, it should be CEO or chief executive officer. Mm -hmm. Or did. Or did. What is it? What is it? Her title is Chief Executive Officer. Not Chief Executive Officer. Oh, CEO. Okay. Chief Executive Officer. We'll take that as a It's that's yeah, a technical it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Technical term, yeah. Yeah. Fine. Just fine. <clears throat> okay. Better than you So, should we ask Katie to put this into final form for us? No. Please. Are you wanting to vote it out today? Um, can we? If you want to, we can huddle in the, in the corner. So. Well, I have my laptop, so I okay. think I could format it. I mean, the only it. thing is changing that chief executive operator. Right, which you've got to put it into, into oh, this is for center. Yeah. Well, center. we need that clean copy to take up, but yeah, yeah. we could okay. vote Okay, let's do that. Okay. Let's vote on it. And I have Jen coming in to talk about 297, which you all remember was the restructuring of the 
Agency of Human Services. And I, so we took testimony on that, and we as a committee decided that we would rather have some decision making going on rather than fail complete, go and do it. We said we'd like to have some discussion about what is the best way to do this. That bill, and Jen's going to come down with it at quarter of. Okay, I've got to leave a few minutes early because I've got money chairs and I've got a chairs meeting, which means money chairs has to start early. Okay, so we'll, and I need you weren't here watch. when we started this. When you started, when you were you here when Secretary Smith testified on 297 and, and the former Secretary Racine testified? No. So you're, but you, I do want you to look at it. Um, this is Senator Kitchell's bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and setting up a Department of the Department of Health. Yes. Yeah. So our discussion in here was that with the, all the things that, and we heard from folks that with all the things that have been going on to integrate health care with um, everything else. services that we shouldn't act preemptively and just oh, do and what we should. Tear them apart instead. And, the, and then the... Never the, stopped uh, us before. <laughs> I mean, those departments have had so many names. Well, yeah. GovOps wants this bill. So if we can look at it and agree that it makes sense, we can simply uh, transfer it with all of our prior okay. notice. We yeah. can transfer it down there and have them work on it and go to approach. It's probably not a one-year bill. It's a statement. Yeah. It is a statement. So that, and we'll finish, try to finish S-185 tomorrow, and we'll, we'll, then we're really digging in on 290 tomorrow and the next day. I am not going to suggest at this time that we meet at 8.30 on Friday, but that we all be on time at 9 o'clock tomorrow and the next day. Well, we have been. Yeah. I was, I was almost embarrassed today, but I wasn't. But I showed her cat pictures and she, she showed me cat pictures. Oh, I felt better about it. The cat in the sink was I'm sorry, I had a room full of lobbyists when I walked in the door. Yeah. Just, I know. It's hard. It is hard, and I know. And I know, Rich, you were busy, and, and I, everybody gets delayed. I I understand that, but tomorrow and the next day, tell them you can't. I can be hands off. I know. I got it. I'm, I was, I'm I'm always part of it. When I, I left to. the cafeteria, if I had come straight, I would have been on time. I was waylaid by three different people, mm -hmm. neither of them. I felt comfortable. No, you can't. Off. I know you Last can't. week, I locked myself in the ladies' room. <laughs> it's the only way I could get away from. Them. Okay, so Katie has miraculously put together a draft. And not all of them. Do we refresh? We refresh. Okay. It will be draft 2.1. 2.1? Okay. Okay, we're almost. We've got a minute. Here it is. I don't have it. You have it yet? I have not posted it yet. It just takes me a minute. I okay. have to go through a couple steps. All. No, I wasn't hurrying you. We're only yeah. changing one word, right? No, no, the, the draft I was working on was she's somewhat different from what she that, was this Go to the bottom and hit Sarah Squirrel. Oh, I was at? Oh, uh, okay. The only thing I thought we changed was okay, that now title. You hit refresh, and under Katie McClinn, we should have 2.1. Oh, no, not yet. No, I, yeah. Sorry, it takes a minute to put it through the pieces to get it. Mm -hmm. 185, draft 2.1. 2.18. Oh. 2.18. <laughs> <laughs> 2.1.
It's not there. It's not there because I haven't put it there yet. So hang on. <laughs> this is how long it usually takes. I'm just hoping it goes fast because sometimes the giraffes are funky. Because I've got it. Got it. Okay, let's look at it briefly. Okay. This is what we just looked at. This is what you just looked at. Uh, it's in an amendment format now, and you've changed executive director to chief executive officer. Subdivision O. Okay. Okay. Is a reporter. Okay. 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 Easy ones. Oh. <laughs> Very good. W Thank you, Kate. My, um, my, my, my first two is not easy. I'm doing the best I can to. Okay, Jen. Okay, I'm going to. Okay. We have draft 1.1 1 .1 of 297. Yes. And I'm looking at it. And this is the reorganization bill. And can you just tell us what we have here? Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. Yes, it's a pretty basic working group. Um, it just would create a working group to develop proposals for reorganizing the Agency of Human Services. It would have on it the secretary or designee, the commissioner of each department within the agency, or their designees, and other interested stakeholders. It directs them to consider options for reorganizing, restructuring, or reconfiguring the Agency of Human Services and its departments to best serve Vermonters, including consideration of whether the agency should be divided into two or more agencies, and if so, how they should be organized, how to improve collaboration, integration, and alignment of services across agencies and departments to deliver services built around the needs of individuals and families, and how to minimize any confusion or disruption that may result from implementing the recommended changes. Uh, have a report come back in uh, by January 15th of 2021. Yes. GovOps and appropriations is not gonna like this. But. Why are we not gonna like it? Well, because they, 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 they're sold on having a, a Department or agency of healthcare. So, There's a, so this is a strike goal. The original actually did the reorganization. Mm -hmm. This is right. It's it did the split. It yeah. didn't, you know, and it sort of put and departments in both. But I think some of the testimony you heard was, well, maybe you should take a piece of this and put it over here, and maybe you. Now this it says that, that they have to. This council has to consider it. Yes. Yeah. Of course, there's nothing stopping the committee from it. considering it anyway. Yeah. We need a bill. To... We don't well, say no. They to... aren't in, in well, instigating I, I, themselves. I, I, I don't think it's just that you know. And I have great respect for um, um, other people. For um, former Secretary Racine, in that, but he was of a time where it was a different world of healthcare than it is, and we were headed in a different direction than there is now. So, we could, uh, I'm saying before we act on this, what we could do is we could put a choice in that should, uh, and add one of the choices being what is in the current bill. That they, um, I think that might ameliorate some of the problems that we face going down the hall. 
can't fit the whole bill, or that whole other bill inside this one. No, I think just or consider or whether there should be an agency of uh, health care administration Oops. with these oh, departments yes. in it and the agency of yes. health services with those departments in it. I, I think see. we should say that. I see. Okay. Yeah, this says it's more explicit than mine. I think okay. we should say that. So we're not going to okay. vote now? No. Okay. But we are. Money we may, so I am supposed to be in GovOps with this bill this afternoon. I don't know. What I would like to do is I don't know if there's any way to get that bill to us that we can look at and say yes, we agree to it. Because what we can do is pick it up and uh, in on the floor, we can have it committed to GovOps with our recommendation intact. So. But, to clarify then, would you be um, looking to put in just an additional, so keep the whether AHS should be divided into two or more agencies, and if so, how they should be organized, whether the whether it should be split into an agency of human services, should I just put it in as another bullet saying yes. sort of whether it should be this specific way? Yes. Okay. That, that respects the bill that's there. I think the bill that's there is extremely detailed. Yes. And it leaves out a lot of things that we've done in the past. Before we, are we done with this? Not yet. No? no. I mean, not done, but I mean done. Not yet. Discussing it right now? Not yet. No? Oh. I just want to make sure that we are somewhere. Okay. So we are going to see something. Can we see something? Yes. I'm going to work on it in the next seven minutes. <laughs> okay. And then is the plan that we would... If we agree, it's mostly done. I as a committee, one piece, so. we can simply, I can stand up and ask to have it um, committed from this committee to that committee with our recommendation in yeah. the But we need to vote on it. We do need to vote on it. So, we want to wait for a hard copy and we can recess for well, two minutes and vote on it. Oh, all right. Or meet Whatever. in the cloakroom. Either way. But we do, I think we, should, we have to see, I think we have to see a hard copy. Okay. Another world. Okay. So if you go to page two, we have still whether the agency of human services should be divided into two or more agencies, and if so, how they should be organized. And then a new two, whether the agency of human services should be divided as follows. An agency of human services comprising the Department of Corrections, the Department for Children and Families, the Department of Independent Living, which would provide services to Vermonters who are elders and to individuals with disabilities. That one didn't seem as self-explanatory. And the Human Services Board, and an agency of healthcare administration comprising the Departments of Health Access, of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, of Long-Term Care, and of Public Health, the Healthcare Board, and the Vermont Health Benefit Exchange. And then I just remembered. Excellent. That's much better. And how to minimize any confusion or disruption it may go. Like right. Yep. So it keeps the others. That's all good thumbs stuff. Down. Mm -hmm. That's all good stuff. Okay. All right. How do we feel about this? Yep. Is there a motion? I'll move it. I move the bill to pass as per the language in draft. Okay. 2.1. 1.2. Now, the. It, <laughs> All right. Well, my effective date moved again, so I'm gonna. I want to be careful about our process here. Or I'm gonna send you a new the one. The process just so that it's all in. Okay, we are meeting crossover. If it goes to GovOps and then it gets to approves by Friday, we're good. Okay. So process-wise, we can do this, vote it out, and pending notice, we can have it put into to GovOps today. We're good. Do we want to still call it health care administration? Relating to the agency of health care. Oh, we can change the title. I'm going to change the title. But, yeah, it's a good idea. Seem, what know. are we going to call it? Uh, well, reorganization the agency, yeah, of the agency. Yeah. Reorganization, yes. Reorganizing the agency. Working group report. There it is. What? Yeah, no, I think that title. It's what, the agency of health care human services or reorganization? Yeah, no, it's fine. Right now it's the agency of, an act relating to the agency of health care administration. Oh. Do you want to keep that title or do you want it to say something like an act relating to reorganizing the agency of We want services? the new title of your. Okay. Thank you. They can get us Mr. Ingram, and we'll fix that. We need to be the agency of human services reorganization. Yeah, I'm going to say an act relating to reorganizing. The Agency of Human Services. And then, so that's good. So we'll, it'll be 1.3 now. Cause <clears throat> okay. I was okay. a little bit. I'm going to take the one for harshness of Doug's. Oh. 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 Oh
because I did thought that, um, from my point of view, he was at a different time. Yeah, no, I understand. <clears throat> I'm going to reword my motion that we move that we uh, recommend the uh, passage of. Uh, What's the number? Oh, S297. S297 as per draft 1.3. Yes, which I just sent to Dory and she will post. Okay, we're fine. It has the name change for the bill. Okay, I'll go find Senator Kelly. Senator Ingram votes yes. Senator McCormick? Yes. Senator Weston? Yes. Senator Lyons? Yes. So the plan for this bill is I need, who's reporting it? Who, who wants to report? Who wants to get in trouble the most? I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> the benefits being the chair. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Dory, I'm going to report it, but I need a clean copy, and I'll take it upstairs, and then I'll get the pending notice language when I like to do that on the floor. This is considered a clean copy, right? Yes. And Dory, can I have a copy? Because I'm going to go. Yeah. Great. And me too, because so, I'm going to put it in my bill. Yeah, give, give everybody a copy that you can. Um, yeah. And are you okay if I send this to GovOps, or do you yeah. want me to wait a little bit? Yeah, send it to Gail for this afternoon. Right. Great. Great. <clears throat> I'm going to go get lunch. <laughs> yes.